Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Michael Zuber, author of One Rinse at a Time. And it is Thursday. And you know what that means. It means we bring on the legend, Jonathan Twomley. How are you doing, sir? <laughs> I am good. And I'm still a legend two weeks yes. later, which is good to know. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you'll be a legend for in my book for, forever. Uh, uh, thank you, Michael. Well, we usually start our Thursday conversations with the unemployment claims. And I'm thankfully now going to put a pin in that. Uh, the unemployment claims were, have been better than expected going forward. If it turns around or reverses, we will go back there. But I think there's more important things to talk about now. And one of the theories that we've talked about, we've touched on, it's been a part of our conversation in many episodes, but I want it to be its own episode this today, is the concept of deflation. Lots of talk about inflation, right? Uh, too much money chasing, too few goods, CPI, PPI, all of that stuff running hot. But when you are a real estate investor and an investor in general, and frankly, a homeowner, uh, deflation, right? If you have debt, deflation should scare you a lot more. So why don't we talk about why deflation is so destructive? What kind of deflationary forces are out there and why the Fed, the Fed's kind, kind of afraid of inflation, but it is terrified of deflation. Yeah. And I think before we talk about why it is, I think the reason that, that or you know, why deflation is more scary than inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the reason the Fed is so frightened of it is, is I think that they know from their history that they can get, you know, they can take drastic measures and get inflation under control pretty quickly if they need to. Yeah, they've like been it. through this. Yeah. They proved it, you know, under Paul Volcker in the 70s and 80s. They broke, you know, it's called breaking the back of inflation, yep. right? I mean, we had all kinds of inflationary pressures. They stepped in and they just kept on raising the interest rate until and just, just basically showed showed the market like we're just going to put a, an end to this. Yeah. Uh, and 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 it did. So the Fed knows that if it ever happens again, they're able to stop, uh, you know, serious inflation mm -hmm. from happening. Mm -hmm. Now the reason that they're scared of deflation is because they because they've been trying their hardest to get some inflation. Yeah. And they can't. And they can't. Right. And it is very very hard. And if you look around the world, you see this. If you look at, say, the Bank of Japan, you know what's what happened in Japan, and now we're looking a lot with Japan ourselves. When you have so much debt in the economy, it is very so much money going to pay debt service. It is very very difficult to get uh, inflation happening because all that money is not going into the purchase of goods and services. It's yeah. just going into service servicing debt. Debt service, and yeah. so it is not. There is no multiplier effect. Mm -hmm. of any of that money and and we've just been piling on debt both private debt and public debt uh for for decades and every time the fed lowers interest rates rather than you know their hope is well it's going to cause people to spend more what it does in reality is cause on people to take yet more debt mm -hmm. and so uh that is you know why we find ourselves in this situation where the fed really it's like pushing on a string yeah. to try to get uh inflation right so that's why the fed is more scared of, of deflation because it just it just it's powerless to stop it uh, you know given the situation where we are if we had a, you know if we had very little debt in the economy mm -hmm. then lowering interest rates would be very effective right but the problem is every time you lower interest rates more interest rates further and add more debt it reduces the effectiveness of doing that, right? So I read somewhere that, you know, it used to be the case that $1 of debt uh, created, you know, $1 of like new federal debt mm -hmm. created $12 of economic activity. Mm. Now it's basically one-to-one. -one. Wow. And so it's, yeah. it's become completely ineffective. And uh, yet we continue to just add more and more and more debt. So, yeah. uh, it's that that's why the Fed is scared. But let's let's talk about you know why deflation yeah. is a problem. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in. Yeah, I was just gonna say, about. you know, this this I just think people need to realize that that inflation gets a lot of headlines, you know, pretty much because we've experienced before. It's it's enough of a recent story where you know your either you or your parents experienced it in the 70s, right? So they they remember 18% interest on mortgages and you you still hear the stories. Uh, you know, no one's really experienced a true bout of deflation in the U.S. So it's 
you know, it's one of these things that it's the boogeyman in the closet, but we know it's possible. And, and you're right. It is, it's, it's all about this debt just kind of piling up and, 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 you know, going to the moon to use a common, you know, phrase these days. It, it's, it's, it's hard for me to imagine it, right? In a in an economy that is so consumer driven, you know, 68% of GDP. But you're right, if if debt gets out of hand and you're just servicing debt that's not new money's entering the economy, what do you do? You I mean, it's just it's hard to think about. And everybody is buying everything with debt, right? I mean, yeah. we have everybody buys things with credit cards, they buy things with installment loans. You know, there are very few people who try to pay cash yeah. for stuff. Or and even very few people who really even manage the way that they use debt very well. Hmm. You know, like I I never carry balances on any credit cards ever. Yeah. Right. Never. But a lot of people are basically like subsidizing the banks by mm-hmm. running big balances on their credit cards. Uh, and so and they're that's sucking money out of their pocket that they could spend on something else, um, you know, to, to drive the economy forward, but they're not. They're just sort of saying their their credit card debt. So um the you know if you look at uh, so what, one of the point on sort of like uh, inflation you know recently a lot of real estate investors are getting very worked up about uh, inflation yeah and I find it really odd to and I'll tell you why okay real estate investors have been dealing with inflation for a decade right they're just not calling it inflation. They call it appreciation and they're all excited yeah, about it. I love that you said that, yeah. They right. call it appreciation when it's on the asset, but that's just another form of inflation. You're yeah, so right. Yeah. But it is inflation that has been caused by, by debt. You're right. Right. And, and so it was caused by low interest rates. The, all the inflation has gone into asset prices. Correct. Right? So now, you know, we have, uh, you know, because of the stimulus packages and stuff, everybody is, and we, and because we're coming out of COVID and there are supply chain obstacles right now, and there is temporary inflation happening because of basic supply and demand stuff, yep. which will work itself out. We have a lot of people who are getting really worked up about, oh, it's the return of inflation. Hmm. Whereas they didn't say anything about inflation for the last 10 years. Cause it was good for them. <laughs> Because it was it was good for them, yeah. and also because it because it wasn't called inflation, right? Because yeah. the Fed doesn't count that as inflation, yeah. right? But inflation of rents and inflation of real estate values yeah. is is inflation all the same. And you know, I mean, there's no better no better example I can think of of inflation when when than you know cap rate compression, right? Where you've yeah. got you take it take an asset that investors didn't think was worth spending more than an eight cap on. Mm-hmm. At some point, and suddenly now it trade the same asset trades for a five cap. That is basically a you know more than a thirty yep. percent devaluation in the value of that asset, right? I mean appreciation, but like, dollar, like yeah, in, the in dollar, your dollars, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. And so, um, so it is. It is. We we've had this for a long time, and you know people have been just, you know, wringing their hands about, oh, federal stimulus, oh, federal stimulus, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be inflation. We, you know, people like Michael and me are, are old enough to remember all the way back oh, yeah. to 2009, <laughs> tw- 12 years ago, all the way back oh, then yeah. to, you know, 12 years ago when yeah. the post-financial crisis stimulus package was Past mm-hmm. and the same people were hand wringing about oh there's going to be inflation oh this is terrible oh buy gold and the price of gold spiked and guess what happened it spiked yeah. and then it fell because yep. there wasn't any inflation because the because the, the problem was deflation now let's finally get back to the deflationary issue yeah. the deflationary forces out there the deflationary forces out there are still you know outsourcing to China. Mm -hmm. right driving the cost of goods down automation driving the cost of goods down right you've got uh, basic people who had jobs that used to be involved in value creation Mm -hmm. i.e manufacturing which those jobs have all been either automated or outsourced somewhere else so now people those people have to go and take jobs in the service economy where they're not creating any value right so they don't get 
they're not part of like, they don't receive productivity increase based pay increases anymore. Mm -hmm. So all those, all those things are driving deflationary forces, right? Now, if, if we ever do like, you know, I, I don't even think re onshoring manufacturing to the US is going to help that much because we'll just automate it because labor mm -hmm. costs are so much higher than in China. Yeah, you're going to build really from not... scratch. So you're just going to build in the automation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's not going it to, it won't help that much, but that is, that's a huge deflationary force. Also, outsource, if you think about, you know, there's a lot of other things that are keeping service economy jobs relatively low wage, like the mm -hmm. fact that you can get on Fiverr and go hire somebody in Pakistan right. to do something rather than hire an American to do it. And like, unless they make that illegal, that's not going to stop. Right. And so, you know, as a, say, like as an entrepreneur, why would you go and hire somebody in the U S and pay them five times what you pay them, what you can get somebody in Fiverr, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere else to go do. And even stuff like, you know, that's pretty high level work, building out spreadsheets, doing an economic analysis. Yeah. You can find somebody very well educated person in a foreign country for sure. who will do it for a lot less because you know the cost of living there is so much cheaper and you know they don't have to charge you the same amount of money. So that also is a deflationary factor. Mm -hmm. Now, why is deflation such a problem? Well, if you are, it's a problem for everybody. And the reason is, I'll talk about why it's a problem for real estate investors in a second, but mm -hmm. it's a problem for everybody because what happens, and this is what you saw happen in Japan, people started to realize that, hey, if I wait to yep. buy this thing, it is gonna be cheaper in six months, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that basically caused the, the economy to slow down as people noticed that they were, that things were getting cheaper and cheaper and they could just hold on to their money yeah. and wait until it got cheaper. And the price of everything fell, right? The price of goods fell. Now they also, you know, a lot of people, when they talk about Japan, they're like, oh, it's because of all the government debt. Part of that's true. But also they outsourced everything to China too. They yeah. had the same problem, right? They, did. yeah. they didn't, it wasn't like the Japanese kept on manufacturing stuff in Japan. They, they went and, and, you know, really screwed over their working class too by shipping all the manufacturing to China, right? Mm -hmm. and, and did the exact same thing that we did. Yeah. So, um, they, so those deflationary forces were also at work there. People were getting paid less. Mm -hmm. There was more, they never saw, you never saw the same kind of unemployment but you just saw people just didn't have the same kinds of good jobs that they had before. And it just, you know, you had the same, a lot of the same forces at work, but people just waited longer to buy stuff. Yep. Rents fell, right. You know, they've also got the declining population and like, you know, lest you think that America is so special, if we didn't have immigration, we would have a declining population too. Yep. Basically every, every rich country has this problem because the richer you get, the less, fewer babies you have, yeah, right? The richer you get, the more expensive everything gets, the harder it is to have children, the harder it is to support them. People have fewer children. Also, the, the cost of, you know, for women, the cost, you know, the, is a big, the, the uh, trade-off cost becomes much, much higher, mm -hmm. right? For if sure. you couldn't work, you know, you might as well stay home and have children, mm -hmm. right? But if, if, if that means giving up your $150,000 job, yep. right, to do it, you're not going to do it now, right? So, <coughs> so the richer you get, the fewer children you have. So, mm -hmm. you know, we we basically are completely dependent on immigration to keep things going in the U.S. Essentially, mm -hmm. right? But the now for real estate investors, deflation is really a killer because you're going to buy at a certain cap rate with a certain amount of debt service, mm -hmm. right? And you know now everyone's buying on the assumption that rents are going to go up. Yeah. Okay, we're buying at a low, low cap rate. Rents are going to go up. It's going to get easier and easier to pay our debt. Uh, the opposite will happen in a deflationary environment. You will buy your asset with the expectation of a certain return, but you will start either have flat or declining rents. Mm -hmm. Right? It'll get harder and harder to pay your debt service. Right? And as the dollars with, with deflation, what happens is dollars get more valuable. Right? Yeah. So rather than paying you know, your debt with cheaper and cheaper dollars, you're actually paying your debt with more and more expensive dollars as you go. Mm -hmm. And this causes a tremendous amount of pain. Yep. So you really, as a, as a real estate investor, are, should be much more fearful of a deflationary environment than you should of an inflationary environment 
putting aside, you know, even whether we really have inflation now yeah. in, in, in consumer goods and whether, whether that matters to you at all as a real estate investor, uh, you know, or not. So, um, you know, so that's, that's kind of why. Yeah, that, that's, that's what, that's what I wanted people to hear is there's a lot of talk about inflation today. We had a hot CPI, PPI, could be transitory supply chain issues, all that stuff. But on the kind of on the real estate focus, a lot of people are like, ah, no big deal. Inflation is good for me, right? Higher rents, higher values. It's all good. But what I'm trying to do here, and, we, and you've done a great job is, you know, folks, you know, at least look at the other side of the coin, which is deflation, because you, you're going to get cap rate expansion. You're going to get lower. You're going to get lower rents. You know, that, that very quickly becomes a a problem, right? Especially when you go back to kind of refinance the debt. Oh yeah, I mean, we didn't even talk about refinancing the debt, right? I mean, when you go back to refinance your debt, uh, it's going to be a big problem because very likely your asset value will have fallen. And now, and the banks are going to say, well, you still can only do 70% yep. refi. Now, just, you know, to make an extreme example, like let's say that you, you're property cost $100,000 when you financed it at 75%, yep. right, when you bought it. And now the, the asset is worth $80,000 and you can only refinance it at 70%. Yep. You know, what is, what is 70% 56. of it's 56, 56 right. right? So you have to, you probably paid a little bit of your Maybe. principal down, but you're- but Coming you're, up with 18 grand at least. Yeah, to, to, uh, to refinance that, right? Yeah. So. That's why that's why deflation is uh, is really an issue. Now, I'm, I just do want to talk a, a bit on the other side of things. Sure. There, there are people who are also convinced that, like, they have to be investing in real estate right now because of inflation, mm -hmm. and uh, because they believe that inflation that, that no matter what, inflation is good for them. Now, this is also debatable. If and it really depends on how much inflation there is, right? right. Because if it, because if you've got mild inflation, like three percent inflation, that's great for real estate, right? Because yeah. assuming that it's wage driven, yes. right? if it's wage driven inflation, that means that your rents are going up, you know, and you can, you know you can charge more for rent, and your debt service stays the same, and the delta is growing, and your assets get more valuable, and like you you love every minute of it. Mm -hmm. You can also, you know, three, at three percent infl inflation, you know, you can easily raise those rents to cover it, you know. And, and if you get behind, you know, it's just not. If you're continually raising your rates, your rents, yeah. you're, you're fine. If you start getting really uh, high inflation, though, the value of your leases is going to be deteriorating very rapidly. So if you think about it, ten percent on ten percent inflation. At the end of one year, every lease you have is ten is worth ten percent less yep. than it was at the beginning of the year. And you, depending on what the cause of the when you have inflation like that, it is usually not because of wage price inflation. It's because of some kind of you know financial shock, yeah, external inflation. shock. Yep. Right. So you are not going to be able to necessarily pass you know that on. Certainly not to quickly. Your, yeah. To your to your to your tenants because they may not have ten percent more money to pay you. Um, because they didn't get 10% wage increases over that time. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is really um, an issue. And then, you know, you can, what will wind up happening too is eventually, and we'll go back to where we started, the Fed is going to jack up interest rates a lot to try to stop that inflation. Mm -hmm. And that is going to cause, you know, mortgage interest rates to rise. It's going to cause cap rates to rise. Mm -hmm. it's, you're going to hit with the double whammy on refinance of, of a higher cap rate and higher interest rates, which means that your DSCR, your debt service coverage ratio, the number you have to hit is going to be much higher mm -hmm. and uh, you may not be able to refinance. So you'll see with enough inflation, you'll actually see foreclosures. Now you may, you may see a lot of people jumping in to buy up those foreclosures because they are thinking, okay, this is an inflation hedge and, and all things considered, maybe real estate is still better than other things that you could buy or better than holding cash but it's, it doesn't mean that this is like great for you if there's high inflation. So um, yeah. re, what, what's best for real estate is a stable, yeah. a stable economy that's growing at a, at a moderate pace. That's, that's sort of like the sweet spot for real estate. Yeah, and that's why I think you know, we've been for a long time. 
I think we're going to have wage inflation here, you know, for the next couple of years. I think the employee has the power where last cycles, it was all about the owner. I think we're clearly seeing that divergent. But yeah, I think folks, you got to pay attention to deflation. You need, at least need to understand it. It is, I think it is going, if it happened, it would be far more painful than, you know, significant inflation. Because again, the Fed knows how to, how to handle that. So Jonathan, thank you very much for doing this, folks. Episode number two, we're going to talk about asset bubbles. Stay tuned for that one. Thanks, buddy. Yep.